One of the fun things of my job is to welcome groups like this to the center and uh, hope we have a good day. I've, I think it's a good agenda. There's been a lot of activity going on uh, in the area of genomics. It's, uh, it's been quite a trail from the very beginnings when uh, we started looking at this technology to where we are today. And that's both on the genomic side and the phenotyping side of animals. But I'm not going to talk about genomics today because <clears throat> what I want to focus on, remember, take a lot of pictures if you're going to get a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I need a bigger disc. <laughs> I want to focus on a new direction that we're thinking about here at the center and have actually implemented. And uh, we've been talking about it a lot with the folks back in Washington as well as with our stakeholders. And I want to give you some idea of, of what we see as a valuable future of the center to uh, the industry. Many of you know that uh, we do research in a lot of areas here. We are like an animal science department or a very, very small college of ag when you look at us. Uh, these are the traditional areas of doing research. And um, we've talked to you a, a lot about the results that we've gotten from these areas over the years. And what U.S. Mark has to leverage with that scientific enterprise is uh, tremendous animal populations. Uh, probably our cattle operation is one of the largest research herds uh, in the world very diverse. It has 18 breeds of U.S. cattle represented in it and uh, in the germplasm evaluation project. Very large commercial herds that are producing progeny for our feedlot and some uh, population that we've set aside to do selection in and uh, Gary Bennett is now looking at the new variant panel that came out for beef cattle and doing selection towards reducing the frequency of loss of function deleterious alleles if he can identify those off of that panel. So the animal populations here are a real advantage and uh, all of our scientists work on those so you get a nice uh, blend of phenotypes taken on those animals. But that's not what I want to talk about today. What I want to talk about today is taking meat animals out of the equation for a minute and thinking about this property itself as a resource to the industry that over the years has been under, underutilized. And I, when I first got here, that, that was something that really struck me, is that there is a tremendous resource here, a very large commercially run operation that can be utilized and studied itself. And so we've started down that path. And we have several projects that um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about today to give you a, a flavor of how, how this is uh, unfolding. We have 34,000 acres, and this is who we are if you look at our perimeter. Uh, 7,000 of those acres are irrigated acres, <coughs> and the rest of the property that we graze, uh, 24,000 acres, is divided equally between cool and warm season grasses. We have a very large agricultural enterprise here from the perspective of farming. And we farm to support our populations. That's our purpose here. We do no research in that area. And this is a tremendous resource. We may be the largest research farming enterprise in the country that has not really done research in that, that area. And we try and run our operations, whether they be the cattle operations or any of our livestock operations and the farming operations like a commercial program here. And, and as such, we're as interested in studying variation in how to manage these resources as people in the industry are because our well-being and sustainability uh, is in, impacted by that as well. So we started this concept of a living laboratory, um, inviting people with disciplines outside of animal science to come look at the facility and ask questions about what would they do if they had this very diverse and actually under control type uh, opportunity to work with. And we have several projects now <coughs> that are 
being done that do mesh with our mission in livestock, particularly beef cattle, but also start to add information, I believe, of value to the industry on the property proper, per se. One of them is the sustainability project we're working with UNL, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Teaching Grant. I'll talk about that a little bit. Some of the projects that have come out of the initiative that Ronnie Green and I have uh, started with each other, the two universities, we each put up a quarter of a million dollars a year, committed to do that for five years, and we fund projects that uh, involve a collaboration between a, a U.S. Mark scientist and a UNL scientist, and the money is spent on graduate students so that we uh, get that kind of, of uh, resource brought to the center. Many of you know Ronnie Green. You know that he's been elevated now to the next level. He's getting to the point where he's becoming less and less useful to me. <laughs> and um, he's on cloud nine because Nebraska is six and oh now. So. so I wrote him in an email yesterday, you can't do anything wrong for the rest of the year. I mean, you cracked the top 10 for the first time in a decade. What, what can you say? We also have an antimicrobial resistance project I want to tell you a little bit about, and then our, our part of the NCBA sustainability study. And all of these focus on the resource beyond our animal populations at the center. This is what we look like. <clears throat> all those circles there are either corn, soybean, hay, or irrigated pastures. So we have, as you can see, 52 pivots under our control. And there have been several projects that people have been very interested in relative to um, this kind of resource. One of them is what is referred to as the long-term agro-ecosystem research. This is where they're going to monitor the environment uh, at specific locations around the country for long-term changes in uh, weather patterns. And so we've dedicated a section of our property there to house the equipment that needs to be done. The location of where we put it is precisely chosen because we have uh, put together a set of these pivots that we refer to as a uh, demonstration farm, if you will. And one of the SARE projects that we're interested in looking at is uh, the interaction of animals with cropping. And here in this part of Nebraska, uh, we have a tremendous resource in corn stalks. Out west, they graze them heavily. Here in the east, we don't as much, and it has to do with animal populations and density as well. But a lot of questions are asked here about what's the long-term impact of grazing uh, cropland on the subsequent production of those crops, whether you're rotating or looking um, consistently. And so these two projects are looking at that in addition to various ways of wintering animals on cover crops, multiple cropping of uh, land that typically is used for one cash crop and, and that's it. Rick Rasby at UNL and Mary Dronowski at UNL are the people who are working with our group here at the center to look into this kind of activity. And we're in our third year of um, collecting data on the interactions of animals and grazing. And as I said, we've now taken this section of land and in a sense told UNL that working with our farming system here we can utilize that land to study systems of animal and crop production uh, rather than just crop or animal uh, in our program. As I mentioned, we have a jointly funded project or program with UNL as well. And in this, we have 11 projects that are being uh, funded that have uh, scientists from both organizations and graduate students attached to them. Uh, the second phase of that was for us actually to fund the genomics program at the uh, University of Nebraska, Matt Spangler and his group to help get more um, money into genotyping of animals, particularly those uh, that are in their research herds as well as in the weight trait project. So this funding uh, program with uh, UNL and US Mark has really been great. But we've expanded <clears throat> beyond just the animal in this as well, 
If you look at this section of the Meat Animal Research Center up in the north, this is by the feedlot. And we have a project now uh, looking at antimicrobial resistance. And the idea of looking at this is to look throughout the environment to ascertain from a uh, holding facility like our feedlot what is the distribution, if any, of uh, antimicrobial bacteria or genes into the environment and the persistence of them uh, in that environment. So if we go back to this location <coughs> and zoom in, here's a project that one of the students that are on this funding program is doing. The square up there is where they retain the water that comes off of the feedlot and then it's distributed um, north to south across that field there. And using some of the mechanical measuring tools that our environmental management team has put together, they're able to look at the density of materials in the property in that particular section as it relates to coming off of the lagoon. And then the one down south of that, this one down here, is where we simply graze. Uh, we don't spread down in that area, we graze. And the dark spots are those where um, there's a heavy concentration <coughs> of materials coming out of our water holding ponds and the light spots where there aren't in the one up north and the one down here just randomly finding them through the field where they found more density. And they've drilled cores eight feet down to look at um, how persistent bacteria are in those levels and then among the bacteria identified, how persistent is the uh, antimicrobial resistant bacteria and their genes. And they're finding um, that there is very little difference between those two areas there and that, that project will come to fruition here in, in a while. We also had an entomologist study us for six years, trapping flies, and she worked with the stable fly, uh, all over the center. And it's very interesting to see your fly population, how it migrates, where it comes from, where you harbor them on the center, and where we harbored them on the center was in our silage pit because uh, historically here at the center, the farmer wanted to sleep well at night and we carried huge inventories from one year to the next. Uh, we decided about three or four years ago that we were gonna farm to the need and we've cut our inventories way back. And one of the benefits that we found from this study with flies is that's where the flies were um, congregating for what turns out to be the fall hatch or the fall bloom of flies as the weather cools. And having gotten rid of that inventory, we've essentially wiped out that spring uh, or that fall uh, increase in flies. Again, something that we have no expertise with doing, but certainly uh, somebody with knowledge um, of entomology of flies um, can make some value out of. We're uh, a uh, facility here where the aquifer underneath us has been contaminated from the Naval Ammunition Depot. The Army Corps of Engineers has gone through and uh, put a uh, program in place, extracting water, treating it, and then releasing it, what happens to be about a seven mile uh, new water system, brand new water system, through the Meat Animal Research Center, and it cascades through farming and um, pasture lamb, or pasture land. We uh, have several of these containment <coughs> facilities uh, that go along that seven miles so that we can control the flow of the water. Uh, it allows recharge of the aquifer. But this is a brand new system and it, and it begs to be studied. We have had people come in who are looking at uh, water management in this kind of system. We hope to, that they'll start their project here relatively soon. But the other thing that we were interested in is this, this water comes up from the aquifer. It's treated, put into a, a uh, well, it used to be a dry creek and cascades across this agricultural enterprise. And what better way of studying uh, a system which is totally closed in terms of the interaction of agricultural practices, whether it be farming or the use of grazing on this kind of a water system. And so we are actually 
studying, there's a cattle crossing across it. We're actually studying as one of the projects the uh, presence of antimicrobial resistant bacteria. Uh, that we will look at uh, runoff um, things from the farming. But uh, our interest here is what are the seasonal differences, the impact of flash grazing in this kind of a program, and as well on wildlife. And we have um, two people coming in who are going to help us study this whole system from the perspective of migratory birds because as many of you know, in this part of Nebraska, we get um, visitors by the millions uh, twice a year. And now that we have these ponds all up and down the center, uh, they're quite comfortable in, in uh, swimming around in them. So uh, another opportunity to utilize the center as a resource beyond just meat animal research. We did engage in the NCBA uh, sustainability study. For those of you who are aware of that study, uh, NCBA decided to study the industry from uh, the totality of the industry in terms of sustainability, created their definition of sustainability, and, and uh, started to make some assessments of various uh, baseline things that are needed to, to look at sustainability. <clears throat> and we joined with them as part of that project uh, back in 2011, and the reason we joined them is uh, being a government agency, we keep records to the, to the nth degree on things like how much time we spent in tractors, how much fuel we used, how much we applied of various uh, herbicides, pesticides, whatever, on our properties and man hours that have gone into all of that. And they use that <coughs> information to uh, help model uh, what's called a life, a life cycle analysis of, of the Meat Animal Research Center. And this <clears throat> is a very interesting project for us because uh, what they did is start here with a simulation program that actually looked at every aspect of producing a pound of beef, all the way from the farming that's required to support those animals, uh, all the way through to the harvest. And what this provided us at the Meat Animal Research Center was a baseline on a whole host of different parameters that go into uh, sustainability and a life cycle analysis. And here, just as an example, we're looking at uh, our CO2 footprint as well as reactive nitrogen. So we have that baseline now. Now, in 2011, we had 6,500 cows exposed to breeding. We had made the decision to increase our research herd by 25%, and today we expose close to 8,000 animals to breeding. And it's very interesting now, once we get this into a steady state that we've just arrived at the 8,000, is to go back and see what kind of impact that kind of change in an agricultural enterprise like us has on some of the parameters that you look at in terms of sustainability. Again, not much to do with the research mission of the Meat Animal Research Center, but I believe a very important contribution to NCBA's program in sustainability and uh, created knowledge for us that, uh, that allows us to look at some questions that uh, we couldn't before. When we have visitors come here now, I uh, simply ask them, what would you do if you had the opportunity to develop a research program capitalizing on this kind of agriculturally vi vibrant, biologically diverse, and totally under control agricultural system? I have pitched this in Washington. As many of you know, I spent uh, 80 of my days sacrificing on your behalf to <laughs> live in Washington, D.C. Um, I did survive the commuting. But while I was there, I had the opportunity to discuss this kind of program with the leadership of ARS as well as other organizations back there. And to me, the long-term sustainability of a research location like the Meat Animal Research Center is to expand the value of this resource to the community by expanding the portfolio of research that we do while we're here. So we're on an exciting journey here uh, going forward in this, this concept and um,
Glad to have the opportunity to share that with you this morning. Welcome to the Meat Animal Research Center. I hope we have a great day, and um, I'll be around for most of it, so I look forward to uh, interacting with you on a personal basis. Thank you.